guys, I'm the CHALL, your Doncaster Rovers fan channel, and welcome to another DRFC Transfer Report show episode, where today we've got a lot of stuff to cover because we've got some very exciting stuff. Now, before we get into what's being covered in today's show, I just want to quickly remind you guys about what's happening on the channel. So, you will have seen by now that the two episodes of the Donny Show and the two episodes of Rovers of the Day have been deleted. Now, that is because I've decided to merge... The, so, basically, the Donny Show will be kept separate from the Rovers of the Day stuff. And, you know, I like doing these DRFC transfer reports. So, the DRFC transfer reports is basically your replica Donny Show. And, you know, I didn't really see there was much of a difference apart from the added Rover of the Day inside. And the Rover of the Day will... I'll, I'll probably bring that back as like a Fat File series further down the line in the future of the channel. Um, but this channel is focused on the transfer reports, the match reviews, doing those goal analysis videos. Because I loved doing the goal analysis video of Scun Thought. So that will be coming again in the midweek preseason game against Bradford when we get the footage from that. And uh, yeah, for the rest of the preseason as well. So let's get into then... Uh, this video where today we're going to be looking at two of our trialists that are set to sign. Uh, well, one of them is one is one of them confirmed to be one of the trialists, and another one is one of the trialists who's looking to set to be signed by Rovers. And uh, got a lot of opinions on this guy because there was a, there was a couple of people in the comment section and uh, on social media that were messaging me saying uh, different opinions about one of the guys. Uh, and as well as that, we're going to be explaining to you why Magic Gomez was absent during the Scunthorpe match. And as well as that, we're going to be talking about how fans will return to the stadiums as Gavin Baldwin, the Chief Executive and CEO of Rovers, gives an update of what the current plans are for when fans return to the stadium, as well as a projected date. So before we get started, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, cut the notification bell so you never miss a YouTube video. And let's get into the video of DRFC transfer reports today. And let's get into all these Doncaster Rovers news updates. So our first report today to kick us off today, we've got GloucestershireLive.co.uk. Massive shout out to them for the information used in this video from them. And it's all about Ed Williams. Now, I spoke about in the last Transfer Reports video yesterday about Ed Williams from Kidderminster Harriers. Uh, and he was rumoured to be the non word on the corner was that he was the non-league midfielder that fits the criteria of one of the trialists. Well, the Cheltenham-born footballer Ed Williams, according to Gloucestershire Life, is close to joining League One club Doncaster Rovers. Attacking midfielder or forward Ed Williams started out in the Cheltenham Town Academy and earned a one-year professional contract in at the end of the scholarship in 2013. The 25-year-old did not appear for the Robins' first team and after leaving, he enjoyed a fine three-year spell at Gloucester City alongside studying for a degree at Hartbury University. He was the Tigers player of the year and made 80 starts before a move to the full-time club Kidderminster Harriers in the summer of 2018. His performances for both Gloucester and Kidderminster have attracted regular interest from higher level clubs and he now looks set to jump ship three levels to join Darren Moore's Doncaster Rovers who finished ninth in the third tier last season. Williams has appeared in one friendly match for Rovers against Scunthorpe United on Saturday and is set to play against Bradford City on Tuesday. Williams, who attended Balcaras School in Charlton Kings, has also previously appeared for Bishops Cleave and Sin Sirencester Town in the Southern League. Reflecting on his time at Cheltenham during an interview with Gloucestershire Live back in 2018, Williams said Cheltenham was where it all started for me and I learned a lot about myself and what it's like training full time. At the time I felt like I wasn't given a fair chance as a pro, but I now know I wasn't ready as physically and matured yet. My time at Gloucester and Hartpre allowed me to do that and everyone develops at different stages. I feel I'm only going to get better now. He also made it clear he still wants to earn... A uh, return to league football. He says, I felt like I'm in a good place right now, but more hard work has to be done. And if I'm playing consistently well, maybe the opportunity might come along. So that is the story on Ed Williams. Now, I've had a couple of people tell me that he is a great player. In fact, one person told me he's an excellent player, um, but needs a better team to surround himself with. i tell you something now. Um, and I'll say this right now. I... Uh, replied to someone, a Gillingham fan on a group, 
who posted about one of their new signings because Gillingham has signed Carl Dempsey. And they replied to me and said, uh, I think Doncaster's got a pretty good shot of promotion too with the signings that you've made. I was like, oh, thank you very much. And, you know, looking at it, and I'm going to talk about the second player a, a little bit later, but, you know, this Ed Williams guy, he might be playing at the sixth tier of English football, but I tell you something now, for strength and depth in the midfield, in the attacking midfield, I think he's a good strength and depth option. I think that if we don't get Jacob Ramsey on loan from Aston Villa again, I think Ed Williams will be the perfect backup, if not potentially could be on the same level of game time, depending on minutes and stamina and fitness, etc., as James Coppinger, of course, is our current you know, attacking midfielder. So I think Ed Williams could be learning a little bit from Coppinger in this team. Uh, and especially if... I be, I'm not too sure if he's been released by Kidderminster Harriers. I don't think he's been released by Kidderminster Harriers. I think it'll probably be an undisclosed transfer, which, to be fair, in this climate, with the finances and with COVID and everything... I think it's very, very good to get an undisclosed transfer and not a free transfer or a loan for a year or six months. So, you know, if this is to be an undisclosed... I mean, Kinderminster fans, comment down below if he's been released or not, but if he hasn't and it's an undisclosed transfer, even though it's non-league, fair enough to Rovers, they've gone for it. Um, and you know what? I've seen highlights of Ed Williams, and I think he's an attacking midfielder who can creatively run through and break defences like a knife through butter. And, you know, yes, he's playing at non-league level at the time, but... I feel like he can translate those stats and those skills into the third tier of English football. And I think that he will be an underrated midfielder if we play him the right way. So I think that Ed Williams is definitely a signing, like all the other signings at Rovers over the years, is a signing that I'm going to get behind 100%. 100 million percent I'll get behind him. And, you know, Ed, if you do end up signing for Rovers, then I wish you the best of luck at our club, whether it's a one-year deal dare I say a two, three year deal because I know we spoke about in previous videos how, you know, one year deals and one year loans are, you know, the way to go. So I think it's most likely going to be a one year deal if it is going to be a permanent transfer and not some kind of loan deal, which I, <laughs> from non-league to league one on a loan deal for a year is um, impossible in my opinion. But I think that it's probably going to be a one year deal. If it's two or three years, just this once for a non-league player, then I'll be, you know, del just as delighted because I've seen some good stuff from this lad. So congratulations, Ed. Stay on trial with us. Good luck tomorrow against Bradford with the rest of the team. And uh, hopefully we get to see you in a Rover shirt permanently for the next couple of years at least. Now, let's talk about the second player, the second trialist. Now, I spoke about the criteria of the four trialists. One is a mid-20s. EFL experienced winger. One is a mid-twenties centre midfielder with non-league experience. That's Ed Williams. We spoke about the Premier League youngster central midfielder who has been released by Premier League club, uh, which is still yet to be decided. The fourth one is a midfielder, mid-twenties, who's played in various countries in Europe, various European countries and leagues. And I think we've got the solution. And not I think we've got solution. I think we... Well, not I think. I know what who the guy is. And it's pretty much said that he is on trial at Rovers. It is a guy called Petrus Boumal. He's a Cameroonian midfielder. And we're going to take a look at his stats and his history right now for you guys. So Petrus Boumal is 27 years old. He made his start in the youth of Sochaux in France from 2006 to 2011. He was into the Sochaux B team to start off his senior career between 2010 and 2014. And then from 2011 to 2014, he was in the main Sochaux team. He moved uh, in 2014 and then from 14 to 16, he moved to a Bulgarian second division, or current Bulgarian second league football club called PSC Litex Lovec. He was in the Litex Lovec second squad in 2016, as well as the CSKA Sofia squad, at uh, uh, two squad, the B team in 2016 as well. Then played in the main Sofia squad in 16-17, and then from 2017 to 2020, he was playing in the Russian Premiership with Ural Yekaterinburg. Now, of course, uh, for those of you who need to know exactly where they finished last season, the final season of him playing at the club, um, they finished in 11, so not a bad position for, for Petrus Brumal. He is a defensive midfielder mainly, but his other positions are centre midfield and left back. So that's a little bit of history on Petrus Brumal. 
Uh, she mainly as defensive midfielder, so it looks like he'll be filling in for the Ben Shaif role. Obviously, he was our loanee from Arsenal uh, last season. Shout out to Broads, Broads from AFTV FC. He uh, says he's going to check out the video, so uh, massive respect to Broads. Um, He's become a really good mate over the last couple of weeks. So, um, massive shout out to Broads for watching the videos. Um, but yeah, we had Ben Shea from Arsenal last season on loan. Uh, and it looks like this new guy, Petrus Boomal, is going to fill in that slot. It seems like Ed Williams, the non-league guy, is going to be back up to Coppinger as an attacking midfielder. Uh, and get the game time when Coppinger doesn't. If we're playing a 4-2-3-1 or playing a 4-3-3 with three midfielders, so two holding midfielders and attacking midfielder, or we play one holding midfielder and we have Coppinger and Williams as a starting attacking midfielders maybe, uh, with Gomez in there as well. Um, but Boomal, I think, is going to provide competition for Ben Whiteman. Not not really for his spot, but, you know, as a partner. But I think the two will compete with each other to see who can perform the best, but work as a unit at the same time. And I think that Petrus Boomal, you know what, fair enough, if we pull this off, we've got potentially a very underrated, experienced defensive midfielder who will know how to defend a line. I mean, you've got to remember, he's in the squad, he may not have played the most out of any of the other players in the in the team, but, you know, you've got to remember, he is part of a squad that finished, you know, just outside the top 10 in the Russian Premiership. And to be fair to them, they've got a lot of good Premiership Russian sides like CSK in Moscow, um, Dynamo Moscow. I th you know, there's a, there's a lot of Premiership Russian sides like, like CSK in Moscow and Spartak Moscow. And there's a lot of you know, different sides that are going to provide competition in the Russian Premiership. So, the fact that he's been a part of a side that just missed out on the top 10 in the league, you know, fair enough to the team. Yeah, yes, it might not be the best finish in the world, but, you know, it proves that he's he, he, he knows how to play at a high level. And if you look at the Russian Premiership, that pretty much equals to around the Championship kind of level in, in, in England. It, that The Russian Premiership is pretty much the EFL Championship of Russia. So... You know, the fact that we're getting someone who's pretty much playing at a championship level or around about a championship level, you know, that's a good um, stepping stone signing for Rovers. And I think that if we do pull this off and he does impress, then uh, I'll be very excited to see what the future holds for this guy. Um, so, yeah, there we go. So that is looking at the two signings, first of all. Ed, well, potential two signings. Ed Williams potentially on the verge of signing. And Petrus Brumal, who's on trial with us and could sign if we if he does well. Um, so I'm very excited. Doncaster are making some decent progress down the transfer window. You know, I wasn't worried that we weren't making enough progress in terms of signing people. Um, you know, very early on, I knew we were going to be quite slow in the business. But you know, we got Lakilo done on a, on a one-year permanent deal. You know, extend it by a year or two if he does well this season. Uh, so Lakilo's a good one, good young Premier League winger. Um, you know, we're trialling a non-league midfielder that could sign that's looking good. Um, a European experienced midfielder, a Premier League youngster midfielder's on trial for us as well, as well as a, a an in the EFL experienced winger. I don't know who that could be, but again, we'll have to see what happens with that. I can't wait for tomorrow's game against Bradford. It'll be really, really, really good. And uh, cannot wait to do all of that with Bradford tomorrow. And we'll get to see these guys in action. Now we know that Williams and Boomal are two of the trialists, the two of the four trialists that are uh, on trial with the club at the minute. So there we go. So that is it from the transfer reports. Now let's have a look at our last two stories. So let's start off with Madja Gomez. And I'll tell you guys why he wasn't there against Scunthorpe United in the 3-2 win just last week. So according to the free press, Doncaster Rovers midfielder Maja Gomez was left out of the club's friendly with Scunthorpe United on Saturday and it's due to a lack of fitness. The 23-year-old was the notable absentee from the 3-2 win at Glanford Park and boss Darren Moore has revealed Gomez requires further work on the training ground to prepare him for match action. Now, Moore told the free press that it was about his conditioning and durability. It's really important they get that work in. They've all got to do it really. Um, Madge missed a couple of days and he'll have this weekend off, so he has to get to work on Monday. 
uh, which is today, of course. Every day we'll have running practice from him, even if the other lads aren't doing it. He'll join back up with us on Monday, and he'll just resume training as normal and go on from there. He needs a bit more work. They've all come back at different stages through the COVID. Imagine needs more work before he can get to the stage where the other lads are. Whether he's right for the next game, we'll wait and see. So Rovers, of course, will play the next friendly in midweek. It'll be tomorrow on Tuesday against Bradford City. Though the squad will be assessed on its return to Cantley Park on Monday morning, Moore is confident his players have come through the first match in five months relatively unscathed, and each of the 20 players involved on Saturday was handed a minimum of 45 minutes, with Lewis Jones playing the entirety while Hassani started both halves, but was replaced by one of four trialists in the opening period. So there we go, that's looking at the Maja Gomez story. Not too much to sort of share my thoughts on. I think, you know, fair play to Moore. He wasn't quite up to match fitness compared to the rest. I know it's, you know, first match in five months, but, you know, you have to be at a certain level to be back for the first time in five months anyway. So uh, fair play to Moore for leaving him out of the squad then. And, you know, hopefully he might get uh, one half of 45 minutes under his belt on, uh, tomorrow against Bradford, or he might get you know, maybe 20 minutes in one half and, you know, that's it. Um, just a little bit of game time for Magic would be enough, even if it's 10, 15, 20 minutes in one half uh, or 15, 20 minutes in each half. So, uh, equal 40 minutes game time. Uh, also, just while we're on the subject of the substitutes I was talking about at the end of that report, who reckons it was Brumel? <laughs> um, but, yeah, it should be very interesting with Magic Gomez. Hopefully, he is back to full fitness very, very soon. But, of course, you know, give him time and he'll get there. Finally, then, let's have a look at the story about fans returning to stadiums and how the club prepare to do it. So, according to the free press, details on Doncaster Rovers' preparations for return of supporters to the Keepmo and when that might be have been released uh, by Chief Executive Gavin Baldwin. Now... Donny Rovers have been preparing for supporters to return to Keep Moat from October 1st, says Baldwin. Um, now, the club, ha now clubs, not just Doncaster, but clubs, have been told to make the required arrangements for matches to be played in front of fans from that date when more information on social distancing measures are being released each day. It's been almost six months since matches at any level will last play with crowd present due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And Baldwin said it is likely that permitted capacity will be limited to initially to 33% with no way supporters present. So that means fewer than 5,000 fans will be able to enter the Keepmoat Stadium for matches. Um, as well as support and numbers, the club must prepare other areas of the stadium and it surrounds with social distancing measures. So Baldwin has told the free press, we've got guidance for playing behind closed doors and we're starting to get guidance on what crowds could look like. I don't believe there'll be a blanket percentage across the country for crowd sizes. I think it'll come down to each stadium and the local conditions. But they're managing us at the moment to around a maximum of 33%, which will enable us to work a scheme with our season ticket holders. Uh, we want to quickly reach a situation where people are coming back, away fans are coming in and people are turning up on the day, but we don't think that will be any time soon. At best, there will probably be a system where if people want to come to the game, they'll have to let us know by a Thursday or for a Saturday, and we can work on that base to increase the capacity as much as possible. Though season ticket holders will be front of the queue for access to games, Baldwin said the club will do everything in its power to ensure other supporters can attend where possible. And he said that we were able to work with season ticket holders, so if they're not coming, they could volunteer the ticket back to allow paying people into the ground, which will only help the club and improve our situation on a game-by-game -game basis. The match day experience is unlikely to resemble anything close to normality in the initial stage of supporters returning to grounds. Baldwin says Rovers' priority is getting fans back in stands, with all other aspects of visiting the stadium required to adapt around that. It's all about the details. For instance, do we have the concourse open or do we have to move catering outside the ground, he said. If the concourse are open, what are the implications on the capacity? Can we let people queue for food in a socially distanced manner? Uh, it's absolutely every detail. Our prime goal is to get as many people into the stadium as possibly safely. Uh, so we work backwards from there and ask how we can feed them and get them a drink, etc. We want to give as many people the possible ch the chance to watch football, but always with safety in mind. So with the season set to commence on September 5th, the clubs have held out hope that supporters will be permitted to attend the games by mid-October. When the government halted plans to hold test events from the start of August, it put that goal in severe jeopardy. But with the use of pilot events resumed at the weekend, starting with the World Snooker Championship final in Sheffield and building steadily, 
in the coming weeks. So there we go guys, that is looking at the current plans for fans back in stadium. So it looks like the plan is mid-October or possibly the start of October to start off with um, with season ticket holders and a minimum 5,000 capacity uh, inside the ground. Um, to be fair, I t until that happens, I do have an idea that I saw WWE do, uh, applying to do with SummerSlam this year uh, on the Sunday. And the point to have like LED screens around an arena and the fans are played on the LED screens. Now whether that's pre-recorded fans or live fans watching the matches and stuff like that. Uh, and you know they get to be involved live, watch the match live from the LED screens. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure how that works. But if you could get people that are watching the stream on the iFollow uh, in like an LED screen format until fans are physically able to come back into the stadiums uh, for, like, for the first month. That wouldn't be a bad idea, you know, but I think, you know, in terms of setting it up and everything, I think that would be one of the biggest issues, so uh, maybe not. Uh, but just something to throw out there. Uh, but, from the sounds of it, the club are really trying to get paying supporters involved in the 5,000 capacity, the 33% capacity of the stadiums. Um, and it's good that they're trying to do that, one, because it allows them to go with the game-per-game game basis uh, and bring in a lot of finances back into the club. Um, distracted by an advert for soccer right down there. <laughs> um, but what I do like is that paying supporters are being given the possible chance uh, for, you know, um, being able to be involved in the stadiums. Soccer Aid, this September, just seen it. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, yeah, Doncaster Rovers possibly allowing fans back in the stadiums like other clubs around mid-October with a 33% capacity in the stadium, uh, like other stadiums as well. Uh, obviously, other finer details are still yet to be creased out and ironed out and things like that because it is a never-changing situation. Um, so it should be interesting to see what happens with that. And, you know, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen with that. So, fingers crossed, I want to try and get in there to uh, to see games um, when fans are back in stadiums or, uh, you know, even before that, if we can do some kind of media access, I'd love to, you know, take you guys inside uh, the stadium. But, there we go, guys. So, that is this episode of DRFC Transfer Reports. Uh, it's a brilliant episode today. Got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Obviously, it'll be exciting with Williams coming in. Um, or close to joining, uh, Petrus Boomal potentially coming in uh, if he's successful in the trial, uh, and obviously talking about Gomez's absence, that clears a lot of things up, and of course Baldwin, as usual, like the great owners they are, keeping us updated with everything that is happening. Thank you very much guys for watching this video, I'll be back in a future day for another Transfer Reports or another Doncaster Rovers video. And for now guys, I'm the C-H-A-L-L, please like, comment, subscribe, goodbye.